You've been welcome to Keeble, the best college in Oxford. Um, <laughs> sitting next to me is one of our honorary fellows, um, uh, strictly contestant, and all the rest. His, his CV needs um, no further elaboration from me. Um, what I will say is that many of you will not know that Ed and I were working in government um, pretty much at the same time um, before uh, the 2010 election. Uh, and um, I was permanent secretary to the Northern Ireland office, where I'd been since 2002 in, in a couple of positions, but latterly as permanent secretary. Uh, he was secretary of state. Um, and our I thought it was actually, uh, th there was a moment, um, a very, for me, memorable moment when I thought we were actually going to be working much closer than we actually ended up working. So I had been um, an advisor at the Treasury from 97 till 2004, worked very closely with Gordon Brown and with Tony Blair. Most of the time it went well, um, but, there were, there were, um, but there, were, there were moments of, um, of tension. And I then became an MP, and I'd been a Member of Parliament for a year. And then um, a reshuffle began in April of 2006, so a year into the new government. And um, there'd been lots of speculation that myself and Ed Miliband would get jobs in the reshuffle. We'd only been MPs for a year. And um, the nature of reshuffles is you basically sit and wait, if you're a junior minister, for the call to, to come. And I was um, up in my constituency office in Yorkshire, and this reshuffle had been going for a year, and for, for, for a, um, a day, it felt like a year, and nothing had happened. And then finally, on the Friday, my constituency manager yells through that the Downing Street switchboard is on, on the phone. And so I picked up the phone, because this, this is genuinely how it happens, and a voice said, um, this is the Downing Street switchboard. Uh, we have the Prime Minister for you. And then there was a delay, and then this voice said, hi, Ed, it's Tony. And it, it was Tony Blair on the phone as Prime Minister, but it was a reshuffle, and I was not sure what was going on. So I said, um, Prime Minister, um, it's great to receive your call. And he said, I don't know if you know, there's a reshuffle going on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, 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 I say, and he said, um, I said, uh, uh, yes, Prime Minister. And he said, he said, I've been thinking very hard about how to use your particular skills and talents. <laughs> and he hadn't really forgiven me for the Euro from <laughs> three years before. And he said, and um, I would like you to serve in my government as a junior businessman, uh, uh, as a junior business minister in Northern Ireland, where, where Jonathan was the, the permanent secretary. And I remember this moment so well, because I thought, Northern Ireland, this is a catastrophe. <laughs> we had young children, what was a vet going to say? But then it was, you know, it was a reshuffle, this is the Prime Minister. So I then said, well, Prime Minister, it would be, be an honour to serve your government as a junior business minister in Northern Ireland. <laughs> and I then said, Tony, I've got to say, it's actually the job I've always wanted. <laughs> which, is, which is what you say. It is what you say. And then this voice, there was a pause, and then he went, ah, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, only joke, it's a treasury, and hung up. And that was how I, got my, <laughs> how I got my first job. So I came that close to working, working with, with you in Northern <laughs> Ireland. As I, thought, I, I, I told that joke once at a meeting of the CBI in Belfast. <laughs> and it went down like a bucket of sick. None of them laughed. It was a terrible mistake. That was after, so close. That was after he asked whether nationalists voted for unionists or unionists voted I for nationalists. Did, no, I think I didn't make that mistake. I think you might not have made that mistake. I think you might not have made that mistake. Well, um, well, there, there, there we were. There, we there were almost. We, we almost. Cut, cut, it was, it, okay. You should tell them uh, them what um, the first time we had a conversation number ten, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I was permanent secretary uh, and being summoned from time to time to see Gordon Brown in number ten. And uh, Ed was uh, Secretary of State at that time, being summoned from time to time by Gordon Brown to see Gordon time. in number 10. Uh, and as I approached uh, Gordon's den, which was off, off a, a, a large private office, but in a public area, uh, uh, Ed was just coming out, and we didn't know each other, but he saw that I was a senior-looking figure and seemed intent on going into the Prime Minister's den. He said, and this is advice I am forever grateful I wouldn't go in there just now if I were you. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, goodness knows what had gone on, but it was definitely the wrong moment. It was, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we won't, we won't, we won't pursue that, because we've got, we, we've got some very big themes to cover. Um, uh, because in those days, politics wasn't quite as chaotic uh, as it no. is now. No. And, I, I mean, might, might we approach this by my asking you this slightly provocative question? There are, there are a good many commentators who focus 
uh, attention on the impact of the financial crisis globally uh, in creating populism and extremist movements. Um, but it seems to me much of the responsibility actually lies with you and your political generation over a longer period for yeah. not spotting the trends. I think that's true. I mean, you know, you are totally right, it's chaotic. I mean, if you had said to me on 2015 when I lost my seat that three years later I would be back speaking at Keeble and introduce as a retired dancer post Strictly Come Dancing, I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> but if you had told me that in the intervening three years... Jeremy Corbyn would be elected leader of the Labour Party twice. David Cameron would lose a referendum. George Osborne would become editor of the Evening Standard. And Donald Trump would become president of the United States. I wouldn't have believed you either. So it's been a very, very chaotic couple of two or three years. I guess I've had the chance coming out of politics in 2015 to kind of think quite hard about the question that you, you, you raise and to, and to try and think, you know, are there common themes which explain... Trump, Brexit, the rise, of, the rise of the far right in Eastern Europe, how much um, was it our fault? Um, and, and I think you're right. And I, I kind of think, back, coming back to here, um, where I was here, 85 to 88, um, did economics and politics and philosophy, when then went to Harvard um, for a couple of years um, as, on a scholarship, where I've been back in the last three years. And so you do, you take your mind back to, um, to our view of the world at the time. And I think that there were... And I think one of the things I've learned and always say to students and people going into politics, that the thing you have to do all the time is challenge all the time the things which you assume are foundational assumptions. Because there's some things which happen which are random and unpre unpredictable, which you just couldn't know. Um, but then there's, there's other things where you look back and think, you know, could we have known? Should we have challenged ourselves? And I think there's three assumptions which I had leaving here in 88 at Harvard, actually which were shared across the political spectrum in the 1990s, all of which we, we actually got really quite wrong um, and which helped explain where we are. One was, which goes to your point about the crisis, our assumption was that when things went wrong in the macro economy, um, when, things, when you had big downturns, big recessions... The reason was because governments made big mistakes. That had been the story of the 70s and the 80s, inflation mistakes, fiscal mistakes. And so the reason we made the Bank of England independent, um, why we tried to legislate for fiscal stability, was to try and lock us into governments not making mistakes. The second assumption was, very much formed our view going to government in 97, was that technological change and globalisation were raising the incomes of people in the middle, that actually everybody was doing okay, but there was this big tail, the unskilled, people with low education, older men in particular, but also younger men after the 1980s, um, men more than women at that time, who were kind of being left behind, whose wages weren't rising, and we had a New Deal jobs programme in 97 to try and keep people involved in the labour market. So the danger was people were falling behind. And then the third assumption was the globalisation, which in the, in the 70s into the 80s had been about, about money, had been about finance moving around the world, was shifting in the 90s to being about trade. So it was companies moving their location from Britain to, at the time, Spain, Portugal, then to Poland, then to India and China. So globalising of trade. All those three assumptions were actually wrong. One, the global financial crisis happened on our watch, at a time when inflation was low, actually national debt was low, the reason we were saying we've got stability is because we all thought we did. All of us missed it, and we missed it having told populations we've got it under control. So that was, first of all, a huge blow to left and right of centre, centrist governing. We thought you had it under control. And people have paid, let's be honest, an enormous price in their lives following that financial crisis. Second thing, though, which is really important, is that if you go back before the financial crisis to the early 2000s in Britain, before that to the 80s, really, in, in America, um, the squeeze in incomes has not happened at the bottom, or well, the bottom only. The squeeze has happened right in the middle of the income distribution. People, part of the global economy, lawyers and celebrities and stars on the highest income, bankers, see their incomes go up a lot. Median incomes in Britain started to stagnate really from the early 2000s. You know, if you think about a bank 
we all thought the problem was going to be unskilled people not getting jobs. Go into a banking hall, there's far fewer people on middle incomes doing sophisticated, quite high-skilled jobs, which technology took away. There's probably cleaners and drivers. And so the bite which happened was in the middle of the distribution, which means you have lots of people saying, well, hang on a sec, you know, I'm not the unemployed or the underclass or the outsider. You know, I work hard. You know, I've played by the rules. I've done all the right things. You guys screwed it up, and I'm not seeing my incomes rise. And then the third thing is that globalization turned out to be about the movement of people on a much bigger scale than we imagined. So the reason why we didn't have controls on immigration within Europe at 2004, when we brought in Eastern European countries, was because we didn't expect anybody to come. I mean, that was the reality. We thought the numbers would be tiny. And people movement, for economic reasons, we've seen in the last 15 years in a way we've never seen before. If you think about Trump, you know, he says, the establishment failed. You guys work hard and nobody's on your side. And he's building a wall to stop immigration. Yeah. If you actually look at the Brexit uh, leave campaign, you can't trust those experts. They just feather their own nests. You guys have had a raw deal, and we're going to take back control. And taking back control means, first and foremost, we're going to control immigration. And I think what actually happened was that um, lots of good things were happening in the first 10 years of what the government I was involved in. But on those assumptions, we got it wrong. Um, and the same is true in American politics and French and German politics. And a lot of the, the anger at the elite, at people who've got better off when other people haven't, and in particular around migration, comes from assumptions which we got wrong. We should have seen that. Of course we should have done. And therefore you, you continually have to sort of think, well, if we had seen them, what would we have done? And how sure are we now that we are? So one of the things I do with the Harvard students now is make them write down the five most important things they're sure, they're confident about and then have a conversation about what if they're wrong, because I think that you've got to be more challenging. Let's, um, since you've opened it up, let's, let's, let's deal with the Brexit question, since we're there, and we'll, we'll come to Trump and America in a minute. Um, uh, that's part of the story about Brexit, but there's been a strong anti-European view in the UK, actually since the 1950s. You could say that we joined the European community as it was without actually joining. But we are where we are. Give us, a, give us a sense of where you think things will go. Look, you know how, how um, I mean, you know, the challenge of our relationship with Europe goes back many centuries before the 1950s. And there has always been an equivocation about Britain being involved in European projects. Um, it was the reason why the Labour and Conservative governments of the 40s and 50s didn't choose to join the European Union at the, um, at the beginning. And I think all the time I was in government, you saw prime ministers kind of dealing with um, this, this fundamental problem that the lots of people, and certainly our media, didn't really ever believe that you could make an agreement in the national interest. So therefore, if you went and agreed with your European partners, that can't be in Britain's interests. And the only way in which you showed you're standing up for Britain was by being isolated. And therefore, the smart politics, Margaret Thatcher over the, uh, the rebate, John Major over Maastricht, um, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown many times over different things, was to, to stand aside for a bit, fight their corner, and in the end reach an agreement once it looked like you'd fought for the British. I remember going to a, um, a meeting of ECOFIN in 2000. Do you remember the, the fuel oh, yeah. dispute? Oh, yeah. When um, we, all of our petrol stations were being blockaded, and this was happening across Europe. Um, with people saying, we need a cut in fuel prices. And so we sit around the table, and um, it was a German finance minister was the chair, and um, every finance minister says, as they do in a European meeting, one after another, in order to sustain the integrity of our public finances, we must not give in to pressure from these protesters and cut our fuel prices. Everybody agrees. And then the German finance minister says, we have a consensus. We will issue a statement from this meeting. Europe has decided there will be no cut in petrol taxes. And we, Gordon Brown had to jump on and say, no, 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 see, for God's sake, he said, if you do that, I'll have to cut them. Please don't, <laughs> please don't issue that statement. Let us all go back and issue our own individual statements saying this is what we will do in the national interest. And a lot of other European partners said, but, you know, 
If we issue a collective statement, we can go back to our capitals and say, look, we'd like to cut petrol prices. Mm. Unfortunately, you <laughs> decided we're not going to. And that was, and that was just never yeah. an option for Britain. If you think about um, the pain post-financial crisis that Ireland, Spain, Portugal and Greece have gone through as populations, and they've gone through it and stuck with the euro and the European project because it's so deep in the national psyche that their way to progress is through being part of that. You know, if we had been a member of the euro, which would, by the way, have been a catastrophe in my view, we would have been out of the euro and the European Union within days back 10 years ago in 2008 because we could never have borne that pain and seen it. So there was always, there was always a problem, but every prime minister until David Cameron always knew that so long as you played the game and stuck with the collective, and you, and, and, uh, then our partners would understand. So if you think about the Maastricht Treaty, John Major plays an enormously important role in negotiating the Maastricht Treaty and says at the end, by the way, do you mind if we have an opt-out? And they all say, go on, you know, Britain, you're a bit unusual, thanks for all your help, but we don't mind you opting out. We got the same opt-out on Schengen. Um, we were very formative in drawing up the, the, the rules of the game for the Euro in 1999, but actually they all understood we didn't want to join. Well, let, think, let, let's until, be, let, until um, 2012 13. The well, decision I, David Cameron made to veto or to say he would veto the treaty in 2012 was a, a terrible mistake because I think once that happened, it put us outside the, um, the collective. And I, don't think we, and I think from that point, I'm afraid the writing was on the wall. But let's not create a slightly, or a slightly that too much false history. narrative. No, 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 no. But False it narrative. wasn't quite, well, you know, it would have been a disaster to join the Euro. It wasn't quite as straightforward as that, was it, under the, under the Brown Blair, or Blair Brown? Well, the, 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 great, the great, I think, first of all, nobody has ever put together a single currency based around 15, 16, 17 more independent nation states with their own fiscal policy before and big differences. So, it's a massively difficult thing to do. It may not be, in the end, a possible thing to do. Massively difficult. The only way in which you can make it work is if you have a depth of political commitment to the wider European project, which allows you to absorb pain, and we never had that, that commitment. So I think, in the end, my argument was really we couldn't have a sufficient political commitment to deal with the economic ups and downs. The irony was, though, we were talking about this earlier. Back in, people have this memory that um, Gordon Brown was gung-ho to, to, um, to stop us going. So, so Tony Blair was gung-ho to join, and Gordon Brown was instrumental in stopping us. And I think by the 2003, that's where we were. Back in 97, it was the opposite. I mean, it was Tony Blair was the person very close to ruling out joining the single currency, and Gordon Brown was the person who was really quite worried that ruling out for political reasons in 97 would have, um, would have put us you know, on the outside, as happened with David Cameron in 2012. So it had to be about a rational, economic, thoughtful process rather than simply you know, a political impulse. If it looked like a sop to the sceptics, that I think our partners wouldn't have understood. OK, let's, let's fast forward. Have you, have you taken a view on the other Keeble um, alumnus who's active in this area, Andrew Adonis's proposition that there should be a second referendum to get us out of the chaos that we're in? I mean, I don't underestimate the degree of the chaos we're in. Um, I think um, the one thing you can absolutely conclude unequivocally is that making decisions of this magnitude through referendums is a really, really bad idea. Once you've reached that conclusion, solving your catastrophe <laughs> through another referendum <laughs> also kind of feels a risky thing. There is a lot of speculation at the moment in Westminster that Boris Johnson will come out for a second referendum because he thinks he can win it. And I have to say, and there'll be lots of people in this room will disagree with this, I think it's extremely unclear what the result would be. But if I had to gamble, I would gamble that Leave would win a second time. Uh, so you've got to think really hard. I think most people, when they look at the, the, the sophology of this, say that basically nothing has really changed in the public mind. People who really want to leave want to leave even more strongly. And people who really want to stay think it's even more terrible that we're leaving than they thought before. Most people in the middle, they think we've already left. <laughs> if we haven't already left, why haven't we? You told us it would be really bad, and so far it's not been. 
the government's a bit shambolic, can't they sort it out? But that is not the same as people saying that they want to change the, the decision. Uh, I, think, I think at the moment there is no majority in Parliament for any outcome in terms of deal, but I think in Parliament there is still a majority to leave. So I still personally think we will leave, and I think it's unlikely, but not impossible, there'll be a second referendum. And I think part of the reason why to be cautious about a second referendum is because, one, it might be won by leave, and if it goes the other way, the consequences of that... I mean, we already have two main political parties massively divided. We've never had an issue which has divided young people and older people, people who live in the cities and the towns and rural areas, it's in quite a way that this does. And I think overturning this with another referendum, which is close, will, will kind of, is, is, is very, very destabilizing. So I would much rather not leave, but I don't agree with Andrew that a second referendum is some kind of simple, simple solution. I, I personally think the most likely thing which is gonna happen is that there is no majority for any deal, but everybody knows no deal is really bad. So at the very end of the process next March, we will end up either with checkers or more likely with the status quo. And we'll say, we're leaving on status quo terms and then we'll try and work out what we're gonna do afterwards. Which I think from a business point of view is massively destabilizing, but better than no deal. I can't personally quite see how this is, um, how this is gonna resolve itself. And it's a nightmare. Uh, yeah, well I share some. <laughs> Just to be clear, I mean it's terrible. I, I, sh I share some of your concerns about the impact of a second referendum, which, which is on the on What's the, the question going to yeah. be? What's the question going to be? Yeah. And the idea that you have two different questions, one which is conditional on the first, I mean, it's, 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 so, it's so complicated to try to... I mean, it, you have to have a parliament with a view, and at the moment we don't have a parliament with a view other than to leave. And, and we have, at least in my experience, uh, a situation in which the two major parties are at the same time absolutely divided and at war internally, which hardly creates the basis for a satisfactory uh, campaign on, a, on an issue which crosses party, party it's lines. It's true, and it's sort of... And it's, it, it's, it's inherent in our political system that that could happen, and it hasn't happened in this way for very many decades. But it is, it's inherent, because we've always had a... Um, political system where, because it's first past the post, the two main parties are coalitions. So Labour has always been a coalition of, you know, Guardian reading intelligentsia and um, working people and people who live in cities and people who, li who live in small towns and have voted Labour for many generations. And the Tories has always been a coalition of, you know, George Osborne style um, city type internationalists and, you know, Reese Mogg or Theresa May style, rural, away from the city, um, uh, kind of more sceptical of finance. Um, and you, but politics works where you have a galvanizing issue which is so strong that it can unite that broad coalition. And so, you know, um, the National Health Service can unite everybody in the Labour coalition. And in the 1980s, you know, tackling trade union power could unite the whole Conservative coalition. And what's happened is that um, Brexit absolutely divides both coalitions. Because as I said, the view of people who live in cities and who are younger and are more part of the international economy is just diametrically opposed to people who live outside the cities, who are older, who are more threatened by globalisation. And both parties have both groups within them. Um, and of course, the important point in passing here, that's also why it's very hard to impossible to have a new party. What do you anticipate my next question? Well, because the thing about a new party is, um, the only way, how does Labour manage to hold together, you know, um, for so many years, this diverse coalition? What you do is you appeal to 100 years of values and history and tradition and things we've done together. The reason why Labour is really challenged at the moment is because the current leadership sort of challenges that view of history. The Conservative Party, I think, is better at talking about those shared values and that history and tradition in this generation than, than Labour. But if you set up a new party, what the SDP showed 
was absent a shared history and tradition, you haven't got the glue to hold together a coalition, which, you know, the view David Owen had of politics, which was a more kind of working, outside London, pragmatic, kind of more kind of, you know, right Labour view, was quite different from the Roy Jenkins, which was a much more liberal intelligentsia city view, uh, I don't mean an urban view, and I don't, because they had no history, they couldn't hold it together. So the one thing that both parties have got is they have a conference and a history and you know, a lineage. And uh, without that, it's well, very, very hard to function in British politics. And, and you might Which is why say, you can't have a Trump. Well, we'll come to Trump, because I want you to take down this uh, particular rabbit hole. You also need a charismatic leader figure. Um, and uh, there aren't many of those in the House of Commons but th there is the odd individual who spent time out of the House of Commons uh, for two or three years. I don't think George Osborne will come back. <laughs> <laughs> if that's what you're asking. Well, it wasn't quite. It wasn't quite. I don't think it wasn't quite. I mean, uh, everybody in this audience uh, will, will own a copy of your wonderful book, Speaking Out. And in that, won't you? Come on. Uh, and and you, you comment there that you find it awfully difficult. Well, awfully is not your adverb, but you find it very difficult to, to walk away from the Labour Party. Um, that's, that's the nub of it? I think that, um, I mean, uh, I think leading in these circumstances for anybody is really hard. I think for the Conservative Party to have um, uh, somebody trying to manage Brexit who voted Remain... It's just very, very hard. I think structurally, Theresa May is in an almost impossible position. Um, she's only there because nobody, they can't come around anybody else. But I think she's, her position is very, very hard. I quite like Theresa May. I never thought she was able to do this from a leadership point of view. And we kind of saw that in the election campaign. But I think anybody would find it hard. And I think at the moment, um, Labour, for different reasons, is sort of structurally stuck. So, uh, you know, people on the outside, like me, who might feel guilty that we're not doing more don't feel as guilty as the people on the inside who are desperately trying to work out what they can do and can't see a way through, through either. So I think, it, I think it is, it's really hard. Well, let me add to your guilt, because um, it clearly... That was a really, really good way of... <laughs> <laughs> clearly, in the, in the public perception, um, following strictly, uh, uh, and even more perhaps following your, your recent television travels in Trump land, of which more in a minute, but let's just focus on the domestic scene. Um, you have, dare I say, a much greater uh, authenticity um, so far as the voting public is concerned than you might have had when you were actually an MP. It's so funny. I, all the time, if I'm walking down the street, people come up to me and they'll say, I used to really hate you. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't anymore. <laughs> and they say this in this really positive way. Like, isn't that good? <laughs> And I always kind of think, you know, well, why do you want to hate me in the first place? But, or the other one which you get all the time is, you know, I knew you were a politician, but it's really good to find out you're a human being as well. <laughs> which also is actually, and people mean that really nicely, but actually um, I think one of the things I learned about coming out and doing um, Strictly, where you, you go into people's homes in a very personal way. The Trump program is the same. You, you sort of you spend an hour with people you know, as they sit around as a family. So you sort of become, it's, very, it's a very familiar thing to do. It's, you do television is incredibly powerful at, at, um, at taking you into people's lives. Um, but if you're a politician, it's like this big, thick piece of glass, which is kind of like the politician. And politician means, you know, weird, unusual, abnormal, out for yourself, not one of us, can't be motivated by helping us. I mean, that, of course, that isn't true of every person's view of politics and politicians, but every time John Humphreys on the Today program says, well, you know, you wouldn't expect an answer from a politician, it absolutely reinforces this idea that there is this group of other people. And I think the interesting thing from my point of view is once you come out of that and they shatter the glass... And people will say, you've really changed. And actually, I think, well, actually, I really, I really didn't change at all. I mean, <laughs> of course, I've grown up a little bit compared to when I was kind of 30, and we were probably a bit too, you know, rough and tough then. But the reality is, fundamentally, 
all the things which I kind of think of as being me, they were all there before, but nobody could ever see that. And what you don't know is, um, it's, it's interesting, Boris Johnson, when he was um, a backbencher, he, um, he, I think for a period, because of how, how I got news to you, stepped outside that prison. When he was mayor of London, which is a fabulous job because you have no power, yeah. um, you just basically can do PR, and therefore you can do stunts, and people, you're, not really, you're not really a politician. And once he stepped into being a politician, I think actually he's found it much harder because he can't just say what he thinks and he gets into trouble and people think, well, whose side are you really on? So I think, I think, I think there's a huge challenge for, for our society because sometimes, of course, I, I blame journalists for treating politicians as other. Every time politicians don't answer the question, don't admit to a weakness, don't talk about getting things wrong, they make it worse. But if you end up seeing politics and politicians as this kind of group which are weird and different, then the only people who succeed in politics are the people who are the sort of the outsiders, who are the populists, who are the throw stones at the, um, at the windows, which is incredibly dangerous for, for a democracy. The, the, the fear I have, look, is that um, I think the moment you step back in, you're a politician again. So I, I'm not naive as to think in any way, you know, I sort of um, trump that. Um, but as it were, as it were. But, um, well, we won't pursue you to the to the final. Um, I should say that it's interesting. It's just, uh, straight after the election, Michael Botillo rang me the week after the election in 2015, and said, "Would you like to make a panorama with me about losing?" <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, no, <laughs> not a good idea. I think I was a little bit too raw. The thing people forget about Michael Botillo is he, he lost his seat in 1997. He then fought a by-election in 98, Kensington and Chelsea, went back into Parliament for another eight years. He became Shadow Chancellor. He almost stood for the Tory leadership election. He only finally went out from politics in 2005. And a year later, we were on the Andrew Neil Late Night programme. We actually had a discussion, which was on, on the TV programme in the end, where I said to him, you know, you lost in 97 like me, and you went back in 98. And he said, it was the worst decision I ever made. He said, I did it to try and set the record straight, to try and go back and show them that, you know, you know they wanted me really. And from the moment I went back, I realized that I was purely doing it for the wrong reasons. And I think he was actually really desperate to leave from then on. I think the thing I worked out, look, being a cabinet minister, same as Michael Patillo, it's the best thing you ever do. It's so hard, it's so important, but if you, go back to try and set the history straight, the chance of it being the wrong thing are really, really high. So I sort of think you've got to look forward. So never say never, but I think for me to try and go back would feel like a backward step at the minute. Okay, we'll leave that. You talked about politicians uh, appearing weird and different. Uh, Trump? So, it's, look, I am... Um, we spent a lot of time in America in the first three months of this year, and... We, um, I think, I was expecting, I've been the MP for a leave seat. I think there's a danger that London Remainers think leave voters must be sort of foolish or deluded or extreme. And the same way, I think there's rather a lot of British people who think if you voted for Trump, you must be either racist or extreme or completely deluded. And so I think I went with a more open mind and we wanted to genuinely talk to the Trump voters, and, you know, and I think I was expecting them to say the things that they said about you know, change and, um, some, and, and an outsider. But I think I went thinking that um, after a year, people would have seen the light. I was expecting people to say, well, you know, I mean, I thought he'd be for change, but I mean, it's, it's chaotic, what he says, how he acts, what he does. And what was really interesting about all the discussions we had was that people, were, they weren't deluded, they genuinely weren't, genuinely, as I generally were not extreme, they were fully aware of all his flaws. They would say, I don't like what he says about women. The rest was saying, you know, I think the way he talks to the North Korean president is not very sensible. But they were so cynical about mainstream Washington politics that they were still sticking with him because it was basically roll of the dice. And I think, I think one of the things that I as a, a new Labour politician, we'd been out of power for 18 years, and I think we saw centrist voters as risk-averse. 
And, and I think in some ways they are about money. But actually, you'd have to say, Trump voters and Leave voters, I mean, it has been the most amazing roll of the dice. You're so cynical or just turned off with what mainstream politics has delivered that you just think, well, you know, give them a chance. There was, I don't know whether you, if you've not seen the TV programme, this really, really thoughtful, really thoughtful police deputy called Ryan Savoir. Um, and it was that Dow had been tasered, which meant that we were kind of having a drink afterwards, and I was sort of still slightly in shock. But it was a bonding moment. And I said to him, you know, this guy Trump, what he says about women is so bad. The way he treats people, I mean, it's not respectful. I mean, how can you support him? And he said, all of my life, Democrats have made promises and broken them, and Republicans have made promises and broken them. And then there's this guy, and the Democrats and the Republicans both think he's bad. And I think, well, in that case, <laughs> it's worth giving him a chance. And I say, still, he said, well, you know, because if not, it'll be back to how it was before, and that's no good. So the challenge to the mainstream, which he, look, I mean, the guy, the guy is dangerous. Mm. The, 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 um, I've never been in a room which felt um, how it must have felt to be at a fascist rally until I went to the Mar-a-Lago club and listened to the speech from Judge Janine about, you know, these people rampaging across our country, burning our flag, these immigrants bringing their lawyers to challenge us. And, you know, let's be, it's a, it, what, what was her line? It's God, my guns, and, and America. And you just sort of, it's horrible. But you've got to understand how much mainstream working America is so disdainful of the status quo. So the challenge to mainstream politics is really, really big. And if you make the comparison between the UK and, and the US, if, would you translate your view about the prospects if a second referendum were held here to the prospects of, of, of Trump? Look, I think look, you have to look. I mean, what Trump did to, play, to curry favour with the far right at Charlottesville was terrible. There is no doubt that far right activity and anti-Semitism is on the rise in Britain and across Europe. So of course you have to be conscious of, you know, we know what it's like as a society to live through a period where incomes don't rise, politics become nationalistic, cooperation goes out the window, and you start to look to define yourself against outside groups. So of course you have to be, to be worried about that. Um, I think the... And in, in our country, the sort of... Um, some of the language which you see used by leaders from left and right is, is quite Trumpian. Um, you know, suicide belt, but belts, but actually I think the same is true on the left um, as well. The only difference is, the other thing which is very striking about Trump, he's been the president for two years, but his supporters still think he's an outsider. They still think he's against Washington. He's managed, every time anything goes wrong, he says, you know, these politicians, what are they doing? And you think, hang on a sec, you, you're the president, you're elected, you're a politician too. And I think the thing about our system, because I, I think looking at Trump, um, I, even though we talked a moment ago about the, how hard it is to have, um, to have parties as coalitions, a, a first-past-the-post parliamentary system has great strengths because it is impossible for an outsider simply to come along and just become the Trump figure. Because you have to, you are the leader in Parliament of the majority group, and you are also in charge. So you, you can never say, Theresa May can never say, how did that happen? I mean, the answer is, it happened because you're the Prime Minister. I think Trump would have found it impossible to operate. I think it's much, much harder to be the British Prime Minister than to be the American President, in terms of the, the art of the politics. And, we have a, and so I, I've become more persuaded that our majoritarian parliamentary system is a better system. Even though, said he, without wishing to nail his colours to any political mast, that it could give rise to a Corbyn or a Johnson prime ministership. Well, the, 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 the interesting thing at the moment in our parliamentary system is that, um, as we saw in 2010, um, and almost in 2015, but then again in 2017, is that um, n no party is getting a, a majority. 
Uh, but you know, of course it is the case that Jeremy Corbyn um, could win a majority in the next election. Although to be Prime Minister, as you know, the Prime Minister is not the person who wins the election. It's not the person who wins the popular vote. We do have that with the Mayor of London and the Mayor of Birmingham, but not with the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is the person who can command a majority in the House of Commons. And so for Jeremy Corbyn to function as Prime Minister, he has to, to, to command a majority in the House of Commons. The same thing would be true with Boris Johnson. Um, and that is also, for different reasons, very challenging from his point of view. You have Dominic Grieve saying he couldn't serve in the party, which, which of course, one of the, um, this is probably going to get a bit in the weeds, but it is interesting. You know, back in 97 to 2001, William Hague knows he's not going to um, win the election. He's really worried Ken Clark is going to become leader of the Conservative Party. So he changes the rules in the Conservative Party to say that the candidate for leader is chosen by the members. Never happened in the Conservative Party before. Actually, really stupid decision. The smart thing they did was to say that only the two candidates are chosen by the MPs. Labour had never had our leaders chosen by um, the members. It was always a coalition of the MPs with super votes, rightly, and the trade unions and members. And then Ed Miliband, basically because the Tories had done it, decided to copy them. And being Labour, decided that we should be sort of, you know, more pluralist and not allow, allow not two candidates rather than five, which is that why you end up with Jeremy Corbyn. The, our parliamentary system only works if, if the members are either one voice or they reflect, you know, the mainstream of voters. If you, are, if you have a tennis club, and the members of the tennis club vote to shut the tennis club on Saturday and Sundays. Well, it's a bit stupid, but it's up to them because they're the members of the tennis club. But if you're a political party and your members vote to, some, for something crazy, and that is not the view of your voters, then you've got a fundamental structural problem. And I think that that is Labour's challenge and Conservatives' challenge. I don't think Boris Johnson, I don't know this, I think it is unlikely he would be one of the two candidates to um, replace Theresa May. Because although he'll be very popular amongst Tory members, I think people would know that he would be very divisive in the Conservative Party in Parliament and is now much more alienating to centre-ground uh, voters. And so that is the reason why I think it's quite hard for Jeremy Corbyn or um, Boris Johnson to, to win a majority in Parliament. Not impossible. Okay. And that, that's quite different from Trump because you know, in the American system where you have the separation of powers, it sounds like I'm a PPEist here, it's a, it, 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 separation of powers, you can have a president as the outsider. Our, our prime minister always has to be an insider. Well, after that tutorial for us all, I'm sorry. To, I was just no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, throw it open to the audience for, uh, and we have in the front row, um, a, a keyboard man. Um, Ed, two-part question, uh, but interlinked. Uh, I'm extraordinarily worried about the rise of anti-Semitism, uh, particularly in the UK, obviously, but across Europe and elsewhere. It's very redolent of the 30s. You know, a lot of the Jewish diaspora from the pogroms and from uh, fascism came to the UK, starting in the East End, very much looked to the Labour Party as a safe haven. It, how on earth can the Labour Party sort out this wretched issue? And is it as simple as the fact that there are 400,000 Jewish voters and 4 million Muslim voters? Is it that simple, that crude? And secondly, is it perhaps solved by a generational shift in politics that delivered Leila Moran as the LDP leader, Ruth Davidson as the Conservative leader, and anybody but Corbyn as the next uh, Labour leader? So, um, one of the consequences of populism is it pulls the debate to the extremes, whereas actually the only things which ever last in British politics are things which become a consensus. So I personally, actually, I kind of think the consensus of the centre ground is really quite an important thing. And um, I got invited, um, rather to my surprise in the spring, to co-chair with Lord Eric Pickles, the Holocaust Memorial Foundation. We're building the memorial next to Parliament to the Holocaust, a 50 to 100 million pound memorial with a learning centre. 
And, um, and, it will look, and it will be particularly about Britain's relationship with the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. Because the truth is, that's a complicated history. I mean, uh, the Holocaust happened because the German parliament chose Adolf Hitler to be the leader. And our parliament and the American Congress made some wrong decisions as well as right decisions in the 1930s about um, anti-Semitism. Um, it was a big challenge in our society at the time. And so part of the point of our memorial is to be a continuing challenge to parliamentarians that if you allow the persecution of minorities in general and anti-Semitism to go unaddressed and unchecked, if you compromise, then the consequence of that can be, can, can be, can be devastating. And, um, and I think it's really good that our government, our parties are supporting building a memorial to the Holocaust next to our parliament. And as a consequence of that, me and Eric, I spent more time with Eric Pickles than anybody other than Yvette in the last three months, which has been quite a lot of experience. And, um, <laughs> and we've travelled all around the world. And actually, you, what you understand is how sophisticated and subtle and difficult anti-Semitism is. I think the, the Labour Party, there's always been a consensus across our country in absolute opposition to anti-Semitism. I think that some things have been said um, by the leadership of the Labour Party in recent years, which absolutely crossed the line and are unacceptable. And I think it's actually, I think it's, 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 I think it's, I think it's ignorant. It's not understanding the history of the last thousand years and how these things happen and how they grow. And you know, I, I can criticize the Israeli government and I've been to, to Gaza, and I know the challenges, and it makes me angry. But I know how to do that without playing to anti-Semitic tropes which have, um, which have uh, marginalised and castigated the Jewish population in the last thousand years. And that's what we've got to do. So I, I think it's really good the Labour Party is now adopting fully the international agreed definition on anti-Semitism. But it's not enough to agree it. You've got to live it, and you've got to understand it. And you've got to know that when you've said and done some things in the past which were contrary to it, you've got to admit that and apologise for it and move on. And I think until that happens, this issue won't be, um, be resolved. So I'm, I'm worried. I'm not worried um, for the Jewish population because I think Labour is an anti-Semitic party. I'm worried because we know what happens in our societies when minority groups live in fear because the mainstream becomes complacent and ignorant. And you know, the reason why we had the kinder transport is because our parliament refused to let the adults come. It's important to remember that. And so therefore, there's some important lessons for us to, to learn. And we're all trying to make sure that they are learned. Are they fully learned yet? No. More work to do. I think we go there, Camilla, and then to the front row. I tell you, it's much more stressful doing this audience than a normal one. <laughs> all these keyboard people, it's like, it's like coming, it's like being, it's like, it's like doing it at home. <laughs> I kind of look, keep looking over, it's like my dad to be sitting there going. Oh. <laughs> Ed, you did say earlier on that nothing much has changed in the opinion, opinion polls. There's been in, huge, in, you said nothing much has changed on the scene, but the opinion polls, you may have been in America, uh, went to a hundred Labour leave seats and found a huge change there uh, and disappointment brings with the leave. I think and then those polls have been followed up by a succession of others. It was a YouGov. I think if you look, I mean, I'm not saying that there's been no change at all. I think fundamentally the position hasn't changed. Um, don't forget in the run-up to um, the 2016 poll, uh, Remain was in the lead in the lead, and that didn't turn out to be the, um, the case. If you look at deep polling experts like uh, um, John Curtis um, or the guys at Essex, um, I think they would say, if you look across all polling, things have fundamentally not changed since 2016. Of course you can find some polls which point some way and some point other, and the question you write, and you know, um, and of course there's some frustration, but you know, hand on heart, if we had another referendum tomorrow, 
I don't know what the result would be. But I think it's quite conceivable, maybe even likely, that Leave would win again. And I think that's actually what the polls uh, say at the moment. Let's get the front row. Thank you. I'm, I'm not from Kieville. I hope that helps. But my name's Chris Langdon. And I, I want to ask you, you talked eloquently about how your assumptions during the, before the global financial crash were wrong, how you're guiding your students to challenge their assumptions. How, with hindsight, can policymakers challenge their assumptions when in government, with all the pressures on government, to avoid making the sort of mistakes that you've described? Oh. I think um, the truth is it is really hard because politics is not like um, other uh, professions. But um, I think you have, to, you have to try to create a learning culture. And in the end, these things start at the top. So there's learning culture politics, and then there's punch and judy politics. And um, politicians who say, I'm going to end punch and judy politics, and then do punch and judy politics every time Prime Minister's questions from then on are not really conducive to a learning culture. If you take something like um, aviation or medicine, they advance professionally because people talk openly about things they got right and things they got wrong and what they could have seen in retrospect. That's how you learn. And so you have to try and find a way in which it's okay to talk about things we got right and things we didn't get right. I actually personally think it's also humanizing for for, for um, politicians as well. But, but I'm not going to deny to you, it's really hard. I think it absolutely starts at the top. So if, you, if, if, that, is, if, that, is, if that is the leadership tone you set, I, I personally, look, I don't really miss the House of Commons very much. Um, I think it has some great strengths in terms of holding our leaders to account. Can you imagine Donald Trump um, doing... Um, Prime Minister's questions, but, um, <laughs> Parliament, but Parliament works best when there is respect and challenge and, um, and people can be, can be open, and it works at its worst when it's uh, sloganeering, and, um, and, and, and that's what you've got to try and do. So I'm not denying it's hard, but I think that's what you've got to try and do. Uh, we go there and then to John Hunt. So I'm really hoping somebody's going to ask about the strictly curse to lighten the mood. <laughs> I'm afraid, afraid not. Politics again. Um, I'm just wondering if you have a perspective on uh, what might be called some of the alternative movements in politics. That is to say, politics driven from, uh, based on policies that are that use metrics other than what might be considered the tradi traditional metrics like GDP and deficit. For example, there are political movements in countries around Europe there are looking to redirect so the, the metrics for success are other than what we might consider the tradi traditional metrics. I think uh, in the end um, as I know personally the metric of success is whether they vote for you so uh, and, and if they don't you certainly know when they um, when, when they don't but of course um, you know the um, Traditional metrics of success are often very poorly understood by populations. And I think as, as politicians, you're always trying to understand what is really motiv motivating um, voters. And um, a lot of work was started in, uh, the, in, in the, a, a decade ago and carried on by David Cameron around different notions of, of well-being and, and happiness and what are the things which contribute to, um, to um, people feeling, feeling good about themselves and their lives and the community. And it's clearly not as simple at all as, um, as being better off. And um, look, when I was here, we, um, I did economics and philosophy. And we, we spent a lot of time studying a kind of late 70s, early 80s notion called regret theory, which is that people don't maximize. What they do is try and avoid... Um, things that they really, really regret. And, you've got, and once you start understanding that, it does turn upside down your view of, 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 of how people um, think about their own well-being. So I think those, those things are all really good and really important, and, but in the end it's about, about people voting. Jonathan. Yep, can't see back there. Okay, we'll go back later. Yep. Do you think... 
think these guys are being rewarded for being willing to sit on the front row <laughs> rather than the back row. That's what's going on. The warden is subtly sending a message. <laughs> Uh, do you think it's possible that the next leader of the Labour Party could be a moderate, or has the membership just could changed? Could be a... Moderate, a blow, I thought. Or has the membership changed too much? Will that ever be possible again? I think, um, I, think the, I, think, I think the membership has changed hugely, and I think at the moment, in ways which are just not really understood at all. So if you think of my old constituency, Morley and Outward, I mean, I, um, I lost by 400 votes... The Greens, who didn't stand the previous time, got 1,400. Um, the, the Lib Dems actually did rather less well than people expected, so did UKIP. But um, goodness knows where that, where that Green vote would go now. Um, but the, more, the, the membership in Morley and Outward went from 300 to 1,200 um, within a matter of months. Um, I don't think that those people don't go to meetings. Uh, there's no Labour MP, so there's nobody really talking to them. Um, but they clearly turn out in leadership elections. So I think if you, if you think across the country, there are, there, are, there are loads more Labour MPs and nobody really knows who they are, which makes them quite unpredictable. The thing which we know is that in 2015 and in 2017, a inverted commas, moderate or non-Corbyn candidate would have won based upon pre-2015 members. And on post-2015 members, Jamie Corbyn wins clearly. So that is an indication. But how much of that is um, kind of non-Labour, non-traditional Labour, people who voted for or were members of other parties who have come back to, into the Labour Party to pull it left? And how much of that is people who wanted change or, or were younger or were idealistic or were just wanted to shake things up? And... Um, voted for Jeremy because it was Jeremy. And I think that um, there is definitely a view that when it, at the point where Jeremy Corbyn stands down, that could open things up and it could... But, but, it, but I, think it's, I think it's really, really unknown. And I think the, um, the reason why people are staying in and, in and um, kind of fighting it out, though, is because the, the alternative is very, very difficult. History is not kind to the alternative. But I think the answer is nobody, nobody knows. Which is why it could take, you answer your question, could be a very long time. Okay, I will go to the back. Um, I think you hinted that the euro might only be workable in a unitary state. And since Gordon Brown kept on inventing reasons why we couldn't join, and you seem to think that was a good idea, and, and the euro seems to be bankrupting Spain, Portugal, and Greece. What chances are there, do you think, that the, Euro will, uh, that the European Union will break up eventually because the euro is not workable? Well, I think, I think nobody has attempted to make a single currency work in this way before. I don't think you necessarily need to have a unitary state, but you absolutely have to have a much deeper set of mutual obligations and sort of sharing of fiscal risk than the euro has had since its inception and even has today. And the only reason why it held together, in passing, because we weren't in, but the only reason it's really held together is because populations have been willing to endure enormous pain, and the political consequences of that so far have been, you know, in Ireland, benign, in Greece, unstable, but okay, in Italy, much more um, complicated. And um, you either need m much more uh, leadership from the center, which for these purposes means Germany. The, Germany as a society has to accept that the euro isn't simply the Deutschmark, but a collective currency with other countries. Or, or, uh, or, you, or, you, or, you, or you have to have populations which are willing to endure enormous pain potentially years after years, or you'll have a, a tightening of a core. And I think, I think if you said to me what, what's my, my personal, more li I think the most likely view, the most likely view in 50 years' time is that you'll still have a euro with a smaller number of countries, which is really based around um, a core. But it's not impossible that you'd have had a, a deepening pan-European state um, I think it's unlikely that it, will, that it can con continue in its current form just for year after year. 
And I think, I think, and I think, think uh, I used to say um, that we won't join in my political lifetime. Unfortunately, that's a bit redundant now. So, um, so I think I, I don't think we I don't think I think I don't think we I don't think we could have joined in um, my lifetime lifetime now. And um, I think the more controversial thing I'll say to you is I think it's really hard for the euro to function without the free movement of people across borders. And I think it's really hard for the European Union to continue in the medium term with the free movement of people across borders. Um, and so finding a way to resolve that dilemma is going to be very hard. I think while there was free movement, Britain was always going to leave. Okay, we'll take, we'll take one more, and then I think we're... So we'll go right to the back, if we may, so that I seem to be reasonably fair. Back in the middle. Okay. Um, I've got a... Sorry, taking you back to the question about a vote, um, a second referendum vote. Yeah. Um, you talked about the fact that a lot of decision-making in Europe um, happens with um, uh, you coming back to the people, um, expressing uh, a position that's in the public interest, the, the, the interest of the United Kingdom. Um, one feels that MPs, a lot of MPs in Parliament, are paralysed by the will of the people. And without some sort of further mandate, they will have to respect the will of the people, whatever that means. Is there maybe a possibility, rather than defining the question as leave or stay in, to have maybe a redefining of what continued membership of the European Union could be, but on a fundamentally revised basis, i.e. what David Cameron tried to achieve and ultimately fails to do? And who should champion that? Thank you. So I think um, when we were considering joining the single currency, we actually um, proposed a referendum for the Labour government at the time. Ken Clark had before. We talked about there being a triple lock on the decision, that the decision to join would be decided by Cabinet, Parliament, and then the people in the referendum. And I think the right way to use a referendum is to, for the government, on the basis of a clear decision, pass through Parliament to then ask for public consent for a big constitutional decision. And the really hard thing to do is to try and to do it as a way of getting the public to give a guide to the cabinet or parliament about what to do, because I think that is just so much of a, um, of a lottery, which is why we've never used referendums in that way in our country. They've only ever been ways of confirming political and cabinet and parliamentary um, decisions. And the fundamental reason why a second referendum is very dangerous at the moment, is because the Cabinet and the Parliament are finding it really hard to reach a view, and therefore it's not a clear at all what they would ask the, um, the, the public. Um, but I also think it's very hard for there to be a change of direction now without that being confirmed in a referendum. So how could that work? It could work that Theresa May um, does a deal and then goes to the country and asks for it to be confirmed, that's a version of a second refer referendum. Um, although I think she'd be pretty foolish to try and do that. Um, it's possible that a deal gets rejected in Parliament and she then loses a vote of confidence. By the way, I think that is actually very unlikely. I think in the end, the Conservative Party and the, the Unionists would rather stay in, in, in power. But you could have a general election either, either in an unstable circumstance in the next year or on the five-year timetable, in which a government says, here is a new way forward. You fight the election on that basis with a manifesto commitment, and then on that basis, then ask the public to, um, to confirm it afterwards. Um, what is the lesson of David Cameron? Because I personally think, I, look, David Cameron was, was in a really difficult position, so I'm sympathetic um, I'm not that sympathetic, <laughs> but a little, bit, a little bit sympathetic to how hard it was for him. But he, he said, you know, I'm going to get a renegotiation, of which, by the way, he said, his most important thing was going to be controls on migration. He failed to get it, even though he said he would. And then he, then he had a referendum anyway. And the referendum basically became, look, stick with the status quo, even though I didn't get my reforms, because leaving's worse. 
And to go back to the earlier point, the role of the dice, faced with the choice of the status quo or change, the voters said, well, look, if the status quo all you're offering, I'll gamble on change. So you absolutely, if you want to change this, can't go to the country in a second referendum on a status quo position. I think it's quite conceivable we may end up with a status quo deal, but that is not winnable in a, a referendum. It's too, too dangerous. So one, the cabinet's actually got to have a mandate to do this and get it through parliament. And secondly, it's got to be about change. So if you go and you say, here are the things which we have agreed with Europe will change, then I think you could win a second referendum. I think um, the truth is doing that from in the next six months is going to be very hard because the dynamic with our European partners is so negative and hideous. Doing it from the outside is going to be very hard because the first thing they'll say is, can you join the single currency, which the answer has got to be, to be, to be no. But in my personal view, Europe won't survive at 28 without controls on migration. Um, and I think the rise of the far right across um, Eastern Europe will in the end drive that. But it might take them quite a long time to reach that, that view. And it's got to be a European view rather than a British view. But I don't think we could go to a second referendum with confidence of winning it unless you had migration control rather than free movement. So it's not an easy thing to do. But your fundamental point, which is if you go back to the public in a vote, it's got to be about change and a new deal. I think that is the only way in which you could win a second referendum. And at the moment, when I hear, you know, Andrew Donis is an old friend of mine, we're both here at Keeble together, his basic line is, we need a second referendum to reverse this decision because all these Leave voters were stupid and misled and the status quo is better than Leave. That is what David Cameron fought the referendum on in 2016 and he lost. So the idea that you would simply do the same thing again Unless you can have a deal for change and reform, I don't think you can win, and I think it's too dangerous to risk it. Okay. Ed, you've entertained us um, and informed us in equal measure. I've got one last question. You, 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 you said at the beginning, you, what, what, what's the statement of the obvious, that you were unique in being two cabinet ministers together um, in, in the same family. Uh, is, the, is the family breakfast table easier now that you're out of politics? And, uh, and well, I think... I think um, it's had its moments. I think um, uh, I always used to be asked um, when I did Strictly, is there such a thing as a Strictly curse? Um, and a vet's view was in your dreams, pal. And I was <laughs> afraid that is, that is sort of how it turned out. So that didn't really cause us any... Uh, the breakfast table has been much more problematic with my 14-year-old daughter who thinks that dads are supposed to be embarrassing, but I have overachieved beyond, <laughs> beyond, <laughs> beyond um, acceptable. I think, I, think, I, think, I think the answer, I sort of said this earlier, is that um, you go into politics and you want to make a difference. Yvette and I were the first married couple to be in the cabinet. We were both cabinet ministers, a part of a reforming government. Um, we, were, you know, we were involved in doing some things which became part of the consensus of our time. Uh, Yvette is very proud um, to have been part of delivering um, delivering civil partnerships, just to give you one example, big revolutionary change only happened because it became consensual. And so, um, so it's hard in politics once you've been in government to then be on the outside. And I think, I think um, uh, she, like many of her, our former colleagues who were in the cabinet, is kind of on the outside in parliament, and, and I'm on the outside out of parliament. And I think probably, um, um, so when I kind of, go off to do some program about Trump, she rolls her eyes and sort of thinks it's a bit, you know, it's all right for you. So I think, I think, I think it's, um, the truth is it's really frustrating because you want to, if you're involved in public service, you want to serve the public. Ah, is that the clue we've all been waiting for? That's <laughs> the, Ed, thank you all very much indeed.